السلام عليكم ويلكم ايفري وان بليز دكتور ايما ستارت ريدينج كيس نمبر 2 السلام عليكم ايفري وان سو كيس نمبر 2 سودو دايفرجنس اكسس اكزوتروبيا ا 42 يير اولد فيميل سبيشال ايديوكيشن تيشر بريزنتس فور لونج ستاندينج انترميتنت اكزوتروبيا For the last 20 years, she has experienced intermittent deviation of the left eye. Over the last five years, the deviation has become increasingly bothersome. The eye wanders more frequently and the misalignment is now severe enough that it, is in, that it interferes with her ability to communicate effectively with her students. She cannot control the strabismus when it occurs, but she notes that it tends to improve when she blinks. She has no history of treatment for the strabismus, no patching, exercises, or surgery. Examination. Current prescription uh, for the right eye is minus 1.75 sefer, and for the left eye, it's one, minus 1.75 sefer. The visual acuity with correction for both the right and left eye is 20 by 15, The manifest risk refraction shows retinoscopy performed over contact lenses reveals that her current myopic refractive error is slightly overcorrected. External examination. No consistent tilt or turn noted. Slight tilt right shown in the photo above was not consistently observed. Exotropia partly con uh, partially controlled in the external photograph above. Sensorimotor evaluation. Right eye fixation preference at distance and at near. Okay, before we continue, uh, Dr. Muhammad, do you want to make any comments until now? No, till now, this story is straightforward. Please, please continue, Dr. Yes, continue, Dr. Aina. Motility. Mild apparent inferior oblique overaction bilaterally. and mild apparent superior oblique overaction on the right. Deviations, distance corrected, intermittent exotropia of 35 degrees and left hyper intermittent hypertropia of two. Near vision corrected, initially exotropia of 14, later in the examination exotropia of 25 to 30, using an accommodative target in both cases. Intermittent exotropia 35 with a non-accommodative target. Okay, here just I will make a, a comment. So here in the motility, we can see in each muscle where is it's overacted or it's underacted. So when you tell the patient to look at the adduction point and up here, we will see the inferior oblique overaction plus 1.5 also in the other eye. And here, when you tell the patient to look at the adducted point and inward, you will see the overaction of the superior oblique muscle, and it's a plus one. Okay. Uh, and here, here I, yes. I, I, I have uh, some points uh, to highlight. Uh, we have two types of inferior oblique overaction. One of them is idiopathic. It's sometimes uh, associated with essential isotropia, like uh, previous case. And the other thing, um, sometimes associated also with intermittent uh, exotropia. This is uh, the type one, uh, which is uh, idiopathic. The type two, which is acquired, uh, related to uh, paralysis of fourth nerve, or related uh, to contralateral eye severe rectus palsy. So the, the acquired, acquired uh, uh, type of inferior peak overaction related to ipsilateral fourth nerve palsy or contralateral superior rectus palsy. Here we have an overaction of inferior oblique in the same eye and overaction of superior oblique in the same eye, which is not consistent with any of two types, uh, either type one or type two. This is uh, a pseudo overaction of inferior oblique and pseudo overaction of severe oblique in the same eye due to longest standing tight lateral rectus due to longest standing tight lateral rectus which is pseudo pseudo overaction inferior oblique and uh, uh, severe oblique uh, 
Uh, this is case usually seen in long standing intermittent exotropia. So, when you treat the tight data rectus in this case, the overaction of inferior oblique and superior oblique will be disappeared. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, Thank so you. much. Okay, here we can see this picture. Do you want to make any comment here, Dr. Muhammad, uh, at this picture? Uh, okay, another thing about the deviation. Um, the, the deviation at near initially was exophoria. X means exophoria here. Uh, exophoria measuring 14 at near, and later on in examination after disruption of fusion, the, 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 uh, the angle exophoria 25 to 30, using an accommodative target in both cases. In such case, we used uh, a method which is uh, 30 minutes to one hour patching for one eye to disrupt the fusion to detect the actual angle in the near and in the far. So in, 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 in the coming, in the coming uh, lines in this case, uh, I, I, will, I will tell you about this uh, scenario and this point. Okay. Here in the primary position, and I can look at the reflex, first of all, you can see the corneal reflex here nasally, and you can see the left eye is in exotropic position. Okay, I think it's clear. Uh, I can see actually the, the, the over or uh, over action of inferior oblique or superior oblique in this picture, actually. No, no, it's present. It's present. present. Inferior oblique over action. Here uh, at this position, you, you yes. see. Yes. This okay. is in the right eye and also in the left eye, which okay. is uh, typically like uh, plus one, and also in, uh, superior oblique overaction in the right eye and inferior, and uh, sorry, for, uh, in the left eye. Okay, very mild, but you can see here where I put the mark. Okay, okay, Dr. Ayman, since your motor evaluation, you read it. Yes, please continue. Yeah. Okay. So poor control at distance, but good control at near. When the exotropia was neutralized with a trial of 25 base in prism in the office, the patient was diplopic. Stereopsis. Distance, none. Near, 140 arc seconds. Dilated fundus examination. Within normal limits, no abnormal fusion torsion, so no abnormal fundus torsion. Dr. Hunter's assessment plan. The examination is notable for intermittent exotro uh, exotropia with poor control at distance. The intermittent exotropia is interfering with her ability to work effectively as a special education teacher because her students are not sure who she is addressing while teaching. Although there are times that the eye appears to be straight, by history, the deviation is frequent enough that the patient will benefit from surgical correction. On examination, the deviation initially measured smaller at near than at distance. This pattern has been described as a divergence axis type of exotropia. Many, if not most patients with, with what appears to be divergence axis exotropia actually have simulated divergence axis in which the distance and the near angles are actually the same but the near angle measures smaller either because of tenacious proximal fusion or an abnormal accommodative convergence accommodation ratio ACA ratio. Okay before you continue Dr. Haima, actually, actually I will make a little explanation about the type of intermittent exotropia Actually, I, I like this table of uh, pediatric uh, American ophthalmology, it's 20,024. Uh, 20, it talks about the type of intermittent exotropia in uh, a proper way. So they divide the intermittent exotropia into basic intermittent exotropia, exotropia with high ACE ratio, divergence excess exotropia, convergence insufficiency exotropia. So let me explain here before we go to the table. So first of all, basic intermittent exotropia, 
and we talk about exotropia, what is the angle at the near and what is the angle at the far. If the angle of the near deviation and the angle of the far deviation within any prism diopter, so the difference between, between the near and far is within any prism diopters, you can simply say this is basic intermittent exotropia. If the angle of the far more than the near, more than any prism diopter, we call it divergence excess exotropia. But if the angle of the near of the exotropia more than the far, more than 10, we call it convergence insufficiency exotropia. I hope these three types are, are clear. Basic, the difference is still within 10 prism diopter. The divergence excess more than 10 for far angle and convergence insufficiency exotropia more than 10 for the near angle. Now, what is the pseudo divergence excess exotropia and what is the exotropia with high ACA ratio? Pseudo divergence exotropia. Now I will explain it here in, in this table. Try to make it simple. So here uh, they said intermittent exotropia present. This is to excess extracellular motility, control both fair poor. We have here the prism and alternate cover test and the distant and near. If the distant angle greater than near angle more than 10, we have, if it's yes, we should do something we call it monocular patching to rule out pseudo divergence excess. Pseudo divergence excess mean one of the two. Maybe this is basic exotropia or maybe this is there is tenacious proximal fusion. When we have tenacious proximal fusion, when you make the cover test, the angle, it will become the same angle for near and distance. So here, if this distance angle is still greater than near, more than 10 present diopter, if it's no after you make patching for 30 to one hour, this is, we call it pseudo divergence excess. But if the angle is still more than 10 after the batching, you should rule out high ACE ratio by doing the plus three uh, lenses. So uh, if you measure the ACA ratio, and, and now I will talk a, a little bit about ACA ratio. So here they said, if you measure it and it is still high, more than 10, so this is exotropia with high ACA ratio. If there is no high ACA ratio after you measure it, this is, we call it divergence excess exotropia. Okay, if the intermittent, we will start it from here, the near angle greater than the distance, it's no, so you should take, think about two things. If it's no, so this is basic exotropia, but if the near angle is greater than distance, more than 10, this is convergence insufficiency. This table, it will make the thing simple. I hope it's clear, but it needs more than one time revision. Uh, during our reading, we will maybe uh, go for more details for the types, but by experience, you will uh, see it easy. Uh, the other things about just the high ACA ratio, uh, there is three methods to measure it, the heterophoria method, and uh, there is the gradient method and the clinical method. Uh, in my clinic, always I go for the clinical method for, for exotropia, if the angle for far more than 10 prism diopter than near, you should always think about high ACA ratio. Uh, if the angle is very high, like if you measure the angle, it's like, 40 prism diopter for far, but for near 20 prism diopter, so there is 20 prism diopter difference. For isotropia, it's the opposite, but for the near angle. The near angle, like 50 prism diopter for near, but for the far, it's like a 20, so there is different 30 prism diopter. You should think about high AC ratio in this case. Uh, what did you think, uh, Dr. Muhammad? Do you want to add any comment or there is anything you want to add uh, here? Okay, the percentage of, of these types of intermittent exotropia, the, the more, more than 90% of, uh, of patients with intermittent exotropia, um, mostly basic or pseudo divergence excess. Rarely we see uh, the, the other types like uh, 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 insufficiency, convergence insufficiency, or divergence excess. And also for me, um, still now, uh, I, I doesn't any I doesn't see anyone with exotropia with high ACA ratio. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Doctor, I will just continue. Uh, 
I think he these very okay these various types of exotropia are most commonly distinguished using a 30 minute patch test to disrupt tenacious proximal fusion followed if required by a plus 3 lenses at near to identify patients with a high ACA ratio if after this testing the distance and near angles are the same the patient has simulated divergence access and tenacious proximal fusion in such a case i either bilateral uh, lateral rectus recessions or a recess resect procedure may be performed if the angle is smaller at near after patch testing but reduces with plus three lenses such that the distance and near angles are the same, the patient has simulated divergence axis and a high ACA ratio. In that case, a recess resect procedure is likely to exacerbate the high ACA ratio and the patient may very well end up requiring bifocals to control a near esotropia after exotropia surgery. If the near angle is smaller than uh, the distance angle under all testing circumstances, then the patient has true divergence access and bilateral lateral rectus recessions are pre preferred over a recess resect procedure, again to avoid creating a postoperative esotropia at near. This patient appeared initially to have a divergence access exotropia, but once she became fatigued by additional testing, the near angle became essentially the same as the distance angle, and it also measured the same using a non-accommodative target. So I thought, so I considered this to be a case of simulated divergence access with the tenacious proximal fusion. This condition is best treated either by performing a unilateral recess resect procedure or bilateral lateral rectus recessions. For, for angles of 50 prism diopters or greater, my, pre, my preference is to perform a recess resect procedure, but uh, her angle is smaller than that. Since bilateral lateral rectus recessions tend to be better tolerated by patients, and since the near angle is not larger than the distance angle, in which case I would prefer in which case I would perform a recess resect procedure, I will perform adjustable bilateral lateral rectus recessions. Another consideration in this case is that when I neutralize the deviation with a 35 ba uh, prism diopters base in prism, the patient experienced diplopia at distance. Yet she appears to have fusion and stereopsis at near, so there is no reason to believe that she has uh, anomalous retinal correspondence that might lead to diplopia. Still, considering that she is diplopic when given more than 25 prism diopters base in prism at distance, and that she has tenacious proximal fusion and an initial near angle of less than 25 prism diopters, I do not want to correct all of the measured 35 prism diopters in this case. Therefore, I will set my target angle to 30 prism diopters and plan on performing 7 mm bilateral lateral rectus recessions and I rely upon the adjustable suture to either increase the surgical dosage if it turns out she can tolerate the full amount of correction or reduce the amount of surgery if she is diplopic at distance with less than uh, the full correction. The next question uh, is the next question to address is whether there is a need to correct the inferior oblique overaction that is seen on motility testing better observed in person than on photographs. She has no significant V pattern, five prism diopters at most, and no torsion on fundus testing. In addition, she has apparent overaction of the right and left inferior oblique muscles. Uh, over elevation in adduction as well as right superior oblique muscle over depression in adduction. This configuration probably represents a mild case of pseudo-oblique overaction that can occur in patients with large angle exotropia. Pseudo-oblique overaction occurs because of constraints on the elevation and depression of the abducting, say left eye, 
that are not present on the exotropic uh, adducting right eye, leaving more room for the exotropic eye to both elevate and depress. The clue that is uh, that this is pseudo overaction is this uh, simultaneous superior and oblique uh, overaction, which would not occur in a case of oblique muscle palsy or overactivity. For this reason, I will focus only on the horizontal misalignment and not surgically manipulate the oblique muscles. Okay, before we go to the surgery, Dr. Muhammad, do you want to add any comments? Yes, um, again, I, I will highlight on the obliques over action here uh, because sometimes the failure of our surgery uh, in treating the intermittent exotropia, if, if you uh, if you don't want to correct the obliques uh, uh, over action in the intermittent exotropia, the, the intermittent the, the surgery mostly will be, um, will be failed uh, if actually if you have inferior oblique overaction but here because uh, as I mentioned before because we have here inferior oblique overaction and superior oblique overaction with, with which is not logic because if you have really inferior oblique overaction mostly you will see uh, superior oblique underaction because of because uh, the two muscles inferior oblique and superior oblique are antagonist one of them should be overacting the other the other one should be underacting but uh, as as the, the author here mentioned uh, uh, these uh, obliques overaction are aberrant and simulated uh, stimulated by contracted and contracture of the lateral rectus so you should be uh, avoid any intervention in uh, uh, superior oblique uh, or inferior oblique here. And the pattern, as uh, Dr. Sara uh, said here, the pattern, you will see X pattern. X pattern means tight lateral rectus here. And this this is a uh, pattern will be disappeared after a lateral rectus recession uh, in this case. Okay, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Yes, continue, Dr. Aima. Surgery. surgery. At surgery, there were no unanticipated findings. Both lateral re rectus muscles were recessed 7 millimeters using the adjustable short tag nose approach. Post-operative assessment. Two hours following the surgery, the patient had a residual exotropia of 14 prism diopters at distance and 18 prism diopters at near with a small right hypodeviation. She had no diplopia at distance or near. The angle of 14 prism diopters to 18 prism diopters was too much of an undercorrection as I normally target an overaction of about 10 prism diopters at distance. I therefore recessed the right lateral rectus muscle an additional 2 millimeters for a net recession of, five, of 9 millimeters and the left lateral rectus muscle an, an additional 2.5 millimeter for a net recession of 9.5 millimeters. After the adjustments, the patient had a persistent exotropia of four prism diopters at distance and at near. This was surprising since I had essentially performed large enough recessions to, create, to treat 50 prism diopters to 55 prism diopters of exotropia in a patient with preoperative exotropia of 35 prism diopters. I have found in such cases that it is possible to continue adjusting to the point where there is no change in alignment despite continued weakening of the muscle. When that occurs, there's a risk of over adjusting and creating an abduction limitation. At some point, you have to trust your original numbers, especially in an uncomplicated case like this. Therefore, although this was not an overcorrection that I typically aim to achieve, I did not recess the muscle further and sent the patient home with a residual exotropia of four, four prism diopters at distance and near with essentially full abduction bilaterally. Okay, continue. Procedure, uh, procedure summary after suture adjustment. 
light right lateral rectus recession 7 mm recessed and additional 2 mm at adjustment for a net recession of 9 mm left lateral rectus recession 7 mm recessed and addition, additional 2.5 mm at adjustment for a net recession of 9.5 mm follow up uh, at the so, sorry dr abdul rahman uh, can you tell us about uh... Uh, your knowledge and an adjustable suture squint surgery adjustable suture exactly what you want to know about it the technique or... uh, what the difference between adjustable suture and the outcomes of adjustable suture regarding uh, uh, it's 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 really the angle uh, which will be uh, the next day after the surgery it's the, the final angle because I, I saw a lot of patients uh, which sometimes uh, came to, to, to me the next day after the surgery, like uh, intermittent exotropia with residual ET, with residual uh, exotropia like uh, 14 prism diopter. After one month, this, this patient came to us uh, ortho orthophoric, nothing, no, no residual ET, no, uh, sorry, no uh, residual XT, no consecutive ET, nothing. So I think the next day angle uh, after the, the strabismus surgery, it's not the final angle of the patient because a lot of things, because of the the, the scar of the conjunctiva, the, the, the incision of the conjunctiva and the scar later on, uh, which will uh, create also a, a attribution to the angle of the, of the squint and also a lot of things you have, you have conjectiva, you have also tenon, you have the, the tightness of the uh, scleral, uh, scleral sutures here, and a lot of things. So I, 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 I am not uh, with, with the adjustable suture here. I, I like the, uh, the surgery, which will be based on uh, multiple things. Uh, angle, uh, 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 angle of the strabismus, angle of squint in the clinic, and also the refraction of the patient, and a lot of things, the palpebral fissure wide uh, width and uh, height of the palpebral fissure, and also if there is a preference of the patient, uh, uh, I mean by uh, dominant eye and the lazy eye, like this. So I, I, don't, I don't know what is your preference here. Okay, actually, I will tell you something uh, about if, uh, when I work with my, my teacher of squint. So, so actually, my teacher of squint, he, he, he likes to do adjustable suture, especially for adult patients, because especially these cases of pseudo-divergence exotropia, the success rate may be 80% uh, from his experience, not more than that. So it's unpredictable in the 20% of the cases. So maybe he will have surprise in the next day. So he preferred to go to adjustable. Actually, because he did a lot of adjustable, he do it in a very good uh, maneuver or very good way. And the next day when he do the adjustable, he make it a straight 100. I agree with the scarring and you know that the, the, the issue of the surgery, when you make it adjustable suture, there is a lot of changes of here at the muscle and the suture place and the scleral and the tenon, all of these things, it will change a little bit the position of the muscle. I, I, I get your point, but I saw a lot of results with adjustable suture and it was good. Uh, actually, the things that he liked to do, he didn't like to do bilateral lateral rectus recession in these cases. Always, he told me, go for the non-dominant eye, even, uh, even pseudo-divergence or other type, and do recessed resect. And he gave me a table for this, and I saw a lot of good results, even I didn't see it in other lectures or research. There is a lot of school, school but he prefer in these cases to go for recessed resect in one eye. He will uh, do the surgery in the non-dominant eye. This is what I saw him, what did he done before. Uh, there is a lot of school, Dr. Muhammad, but maybe he's right. Maybe there is other doctor, they are right. But I saw a good results of it. Uh, let us continue reading, but if anyone want to add anything about his experience of pseudo-divergence, 
we would like to hear from him. Dr. Sarah, she show adjustable suture table. Uh, okay, Dr. Sarah, do you want to read it? Please read it. Hello, everyone. How are you? How are you, Dr. Sarah? Dr. Sarah from Iraq. She is our colleague in Arabic world before. Uh, Dr. Sarah, read it and tell us what you want to add. Yes. Uh, indication of adjustable sutures. Examples here are acquired vertical deviation associated with thyroid myopathy as it is more predictable for the patient and also a blow, blowout fracture of the floor of the orbit, six pulsi. Okay. Uh, these are the incompetent uh, causes. And adult exotropia. Adult exotropia included in adjustable sutures at, as uh, Karinsky said, uh, and re-operation with the scarring of the surrounding tissue. So uh, mostly is incompetent, except the adult exotropia. Uh, I didn't see uh, adjustable suture in exotropia before, but uh, many يعني, uh, use it uh, as in recent uh, Pleasant, no. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sara. But here, you know, an incompetent squint. You are dealing uh, with the primary angle here. Yes. Uh, uh, so, you know, we, we are in actually, you should deal with a primary angle and secondary angle also. Uh, yes. Okay, it's, it's, it's good. It's good. Uh, to deal with the primary angle, like uh, in uh, in such case with the sick nerve palsy, especially in sick nerve palsy, it's good, okay. But uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, the secondary angle also here will make a a, a contribution to to uh, to, be, to to the patient uh, because uh, sometimes. We it have, is the bothering it, one, and the yes. secondary, not the primary one. Yes, you are right. You know, I have a case with the sick nerve palsy in the primary position. He is ortho, is ortho, mm -hmm. and in secondary angle, uh, the right gaze uh, some somewhat uh, uh, exotropic, and uh, another case, uh, another gaze, the left gaze, isotropic. So here it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma to treat this, these types of patients. Uh, so in adjustable sutures, uh, it's a good way. Okay, it's not yeah, but, but the, we have a limited, I think, a limited indication for for adjustable suture. We we cannot uh, perform this adjustable suture on children. Uh, we cannot also uh, um, use it in some in some cases like somewhat uh, a, a case with a buckle, a retinal buckle, because uh, you are dealing here with. Uh, a very risk patient or some some cases of high myope because okay so i i agree with you we can we can use it in special cases okay thank you dr Muhammad. dr rabia zafar do you want to add anything about your experience with adjustable suture oh dr aimu continue um, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are audible, Dr. Rabia. Dr. Rabia so, is a um, Catholic ophthalmologist from so, Pakistan. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Abdurrahman. So I would like to uh, say that uh, regarding the dosage of the surgery a Hunter has done in this particular case, I would take that with a little pinch of salt. The reason being it's, it's way too much research is done uh, about each muscle. It's 9.5 millimeter in each muscle. So that is a bit too over-exaggerated in my opinion. For 35 um, angle and a patient having diplopia at 25. So the post-op diplopia test was positive in this case. And uh, 9.5 millimeter recession in both muscles, that's a bit too over-exaggerated. That's my concern in this case. Secondly, Dr. Abdurrahman, uh, I would like to ask you your rule of 15. Can we apply that in this particular case? No, no, rule of 15, just uh, we use it in isotropia cases. Just for Fine. isotropia, infantile isotropia, or uh, partially accommodated isotropia. For uh, exotropia, we didn't use this rule. 
So it's a rule of 15 for isotropia cases. Okay. Uh, I, I have a special uh, uh, numerative data in intermittent exotropia with emetropic patient. Cut point uh, 35, 35 prism diopter. Uh, I did uh, 7.5 millimeter recession, bilateral recession. If uh, you have uh, 30 prism diopter, I did 6.5. If you have uh, a patient with uh, a 40, I I will did uh, I will do sorry uh, uh, eight by uh, eight by uh, eight and a half millimeter. So I will add or uh, subtract one uh, millimeter to the cut point. Cut point uh, 35 prism diopter. I will I will I will do uh, 7.5 millimeter recession bilateral bilateral rectus recession. Okay, how is the result, Doctor Muhammad? Very good. Next day, very good. Very, very good, very good. For for, oh. for uh, divergence excess exotropia or for which type? Uh, I, as I uh, I said before, the the uh, the majority of the patient is a basic or simulated type. Basic. But, okay. uh, I have just one case with divergence excess, and uh, I have uh, like uh, five to six uh, cases with a uh, convergence insufficiency. Convergence oh. insufficiency really uh, I attack the medial rectus, medial rectus tucking, or medial rectus resection. Yes, also Kenneth Wright he mentioned about medial rectus and convergence insufficiency. Okay, let, let us continue. Then let us see what is the what, what happening here in this case. Okay, Dr. Aima, can you please continue reading? Follow up. At the two month post operative visit. She reported that her eye alignment had been very good ever since the surgery. She had some concerns about the left eye drifting outward briefly at the end of the day, but this was easily corrected with a blink. Examination. Visual acuity with correction in the right eye was 20 by 20. In the left eye, it was 20 by 15. External examination. No tilt or turn noted. Patient is fixating to the left of the camera in this image. Sensory motor evaluation. Right eye fixation preference at distance and at near. Motility. Ductions and versions were full with perhaps mild residual inferior oblique overaction of the left eye. Deviations. Distant corrected intermittent exotropia. 10. Um, left hypertropia. Intermittent 2. Uh, in the near corrected, deviation was uh, exophoria of 8 to 10 degrees. Excellent control at distance and at near. Stereopsis unchanged from preoperative measurements, not measurable at distance, and 140 arc second at near. Additional follow up. One year after surgery, the patient reported by email continued excellent. Uh, alignment and no diplopia. I have a question here for you, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman and Dr. Rabiha. The patient before surgery, uh, I think uh, she, she doesn't, uh, uh, she didn't has, have a uh, left hypotropia or left hypertropia, sorry here. Uh, but after the surgery, uh, she had uh, left hypertropia in the primary position and the right case and left case. What is the cause for hypertrophia here? The pseudo, uh, the pseudo of inferior oblique overaction that you mentioned before. No. Dr. Rabia, do you have any other idea? I'm not it sure. can be perhaps the muscle muscle bellies. They usually act differently at times. Yes, I agree with you. And maybe after surgery. So yes, in this, this particular the... case, perhaps this is the reason. Yes, I agree with you, yes. Okay, you can continue. What, what Muhammad, exactly you mean about that? Again, again, when, when uh, as a surgeon, do recession, sometimes we shift uh, iatrogenic. We shift the belly of the muscle uh, up shift or down shift. Uh, if, you, if you shift the, the lateral rectus down, uh, downward, like two, like uh, if, if a few millimeters, you will have hypotropia after the surgery. Oh, thank you. 
Yes, Dr. Ayla, continue. Review lessons learned. The term pseudo-divergence axis or simulated divergence axis describes an exotropia that appears to be worse at distance uh, than at near. First, because of near synkinesis triad, linking accommodation and convergence, as well as pupillary constriction. And second, because of tenacious proximal fusion, the ability of an exotropic patient to maintain fusion at near um, despite occlusion, either of which may reduce the near angle. To bring out the true extent of the near deviation, a patch test can be used to maximally disassociate the eyes before evaluating the total deviation. While that would have been the most uh, rigorous way to proceed in this case, the increase in angle with a non-accommodative light source as a target, as well as the increased angle at the end of the examination after fusion has had been disrupted demonstrated sufficiently that indeed the distance and near deviations were essentially the same. For simulated divergence axis, the classic teaching regarding surgery is to perform a resect recess procedure as is the case for the treatment of a basic exotropia in which the angle at distance and near within approximately 5 to 10 prism diopters. However, evidence suggests that bilateral lateral rectus recessions for simulated divergence axis may be equally effective. In this case, I was, uh, I was a little more cautious about the amount of surgery that I performed because of because post-operative diplopia testing fully correcting the target surge fully correcting the target surgical angle using prism suggested that surgically correcting the full angle might cause diplopia a positive response to the post-operative diplopia test may in some cases be a sign of arc arc is a sensor sensorial adaptation to strabismus that generally occurs in patients with long-standing constant strabismus and limited binocular vision. It is commonly observed, for example, in patients with unoperated congenital esotropia. ARC develops when the brain maps the object of regard to a virtual point outside of the fovea, sometimes referred to as pseudophobia. While the pseudophobia is not a physical structure, it helps explain the concept of ARC Patients with well-developed ARC may even report a normal fusion response, but not stereopsis on certain sensory tests despite an obvious manifest trabismus. The pseudophobia only exists. However, under binocular conditions, ARC is not to be confused with eccentric fixation. The diagnosis of ARC can be confirmed with an after-image testing in which an elongated flash tube is used to imprint a horizontal after-image on one retina and a vertical after-image on the other. Under binocular viewing conditions, a patient with strabismus but no ARC will see a vertical and horizontal lines intersect in a plus pattern, whereas a patient with ARC will see the vertical and horizontal lines displaced in, in a sideways T pattern. Since our patient had intermittent strabismus acquired in adulthood and some stereopsis, my suspicion for ARC was not as high as it would have been for, say, a 30-year-old patient with a lifelong history of unoperated esotropia. But the diplopia that the patient observed with full correction of the exotropia was sufficient to make me pause long enough to reduce the surgical dosage by 0.5 millimeters. The reason ARC is such a concern in, in that is that patients with ARC can develop disabling diplopia despite excellent binocular alignment after surgery. I'm aware of I'm aware of patients who have asked to have their strabismus surgery reversed because of the diplopia associated with ARC. I personally uh, cared for an attorney with long-standing exotropia who, at delayed suture adjustment one week after surgery, was sufficiently symptomatic that I partially resorted her 
restored her exotropia of two prism diopters to an exotropia of 10 prism diopters to 12 prism diopters with a good com compromise result, mild exotropia and no diplopia. One way to identify patients who are at a risk of of post-operative diplopia in advance of surgery is to perform a trial of Botox. In one study, 2.5% of patients injected with Botox as a preview of horizontal strabismus surgery chose not to have the surgery as a result of troubling diplopia that developed. I do not personally use this approach because it delays the surgery by at least four months, and I have found that, as noted above, with the adjustable suture, I have approximately one week to reverse the surgery. With, uh, with an office suture adjustment, if the patient is diplopic despite a satisfactory horizontal alignment. Although there were still some suggestions of um, overaction of the inferior and superior oblique muscles after surgery, both were less notable after bilateral lateral rectus recessions than they were performed than they were before surgery, suggesting that the orbital restriction hypothesis noted above was a contributing factor and further validating the decision not to operate on the inferior oblique muscles. With that said, she ended up with a curious asymptomatic left hypertropia of two prism diopters that we did not measure before surgery. I cannot explain where that came from other than to say that perhaps in patients with reduced binocular vision, 140 arc second of stereo at near zero at distance, there is more room for small asymptomatic deviations to develop. I remain surprised that operating for what amounted to 55 prism diopters of exotropia only corrected about 25 prism diopters of exotropia in this case, but fortunately the residual exotropia of 10 prism diopters in primary position was easily controlled and or not visible and the patient remained satisfied with the results now one year after surgery. Okay, thank you Dr. Aima. Uh, let us postpone the review question a little bit. Dr. Mohammed, do you want to add any comments here? Yes, uh, here the, the question for the author, uh, he, he argue here that uh, the correction of 55 prism diopter here at just, uh, uh, just uh, 24 or 25 prism diopter because here it's a, a, a not a muscle it's a, not a naive muscle. It's a, uh, a muscle with a, it's a tight muscle. So the 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 data or the the values or the dosage of the uh, lateral rectus resection and medial rectus resection here doesn't uh, doesn't have the same value uh, for the naive muscles. Doesn't have the same value of what? Yes. Yes. Because it's a, a, a not a straight, a straight uh, muscle. It's a not, uh, it's a not healthy muscle here. It's a not healthy muscle. Okay. Thank you. Because because the the same scenario in in uh, child uh, like uh, five years or six years age, uh, the 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 surgery will almost should be sufficient to correct uh, seven point five will correct. A 35 prism diopter, but here because of a tight muscle, uh, like it's like incomitant incomitant strabismus. Sometimes incomitant strabismus, uh, when you do like be, be, by medial rectus recession or bilateral rectus recession, the uh, the usual uh, value of recession sometimes uh, give you another or a surprise effect sometimes over corrected or sometimes residual result okay let me just add uh, some points here about normal retinal correspondence and abnormal retinal correspondence uh, the normal retinal correspondence if we have like here let me just make a new image try to draw okay so we have like an object here and this object it will go to the nasal retina here at point A. Okay. Uh, I hope it's clear, maybe it's not very clear. And to the peripheral retina at the point B. 
So, so the degree from the fovea here at the nasal part, like 10 degree, it sh should be 10 degree at the peripheral part of the fovea in the other eye. This is what we call it, like here B point and here A point. This is what we call it corresponding point. So 10 degree from the fovea in this eye nasally, it will have corresponding point at 10 degree peripherally from the fovea in the other eye. This is, we call it corresponding point because the eye, it's alignment. And this is what we will lead to the binocular uh, vision. And this is what will, uh, what will lead to the stereopsis image. So when we have two corresponding points, we will have binocular uh, vision and we will have stereopsis. But when we have strabismus in one eye, this corresponding the two points, it will not corresponding at the same degree at the retina. This is what we will, lead, will lead to the diplopia. Okay, this is just uh, how to understand what is the meaning of abnormal retinal correspondence and normal retinal correspondence. Uh, about the after image, actually, the most beautiful book who explain the after image, I think, American Academy. Uh, let me go to American Academy quickly. We will read it just to understand what the meaning of after image test. Okay, it's here. Okay, Dr. Aima, can you continue please reading the after image test here? The after image test. In the after image test, the macula of each eye is stimulated by having each eye fixate on a linear light filament separately which produces a different linear after image in each eye, one horizontal and one vertical. Because suppression scotoma typically extend along the horizontal retinal meridian and may obscure most of a horizontal after image, the vertical after image is induced by the deviating eye and the horizontal after image in the fixating eye. The patient is then asked to draw the relative positions of the perceived after images a patient with normal retinal correspondence with or without manifest strabismus will view the image in a crossed configuration. The configuration of the images in patients with abnormal retinal correspondence and horizontal strabismus are shown in figure 6, uh, one, uh, 613 B and C. In patients with eccentric fixation, the after image is extra foveal and the test cannot be interpreted. The after image test is very dissociative. Demonstration of abnormal retinal correspondence indicates that it is dense. Okay, here I think this is the, the picture A and B and C. So here after image test in picture A, there is normal cor uh, retinal correspondence. You see the horizontal and vertical line as a cruciate, and this is the normal due to these two points of corresponding in the both eye at the retina. But when he has a abnormal retinal corresponding in the isotropia case, he will see it like this, T-shape. This is the left eye. He will see them separated and in the right eye horizontal and the vertical line here. And abnormal retinal correspondence in the exotropia, he will see it like this. Okay, I hope it's more clear or more simple now what they mean about it. Okay, let us finish uh, the questions and then we will see if there is any question or any other discussion. Uh, yes, Dr. Aima, please continue the review questions. <clears throat> Describe the different types of divergence access exotropia and how to distinguish among them. In divergence access exotropia, the angle of strabismus measures greater at distance than at near. This may be due to either true divergence axis or simulated pseudo-divergence axis. In pseudo-divergence axis exotropia, the angle equalizes either after a 30-minute batch test, which dissociates the eye and disrupts tenacious proximal fusion, or with plus three lenses in patients with high ACA ratio. If none of this testing causes the near angle to increase to match the dis distance angle, the patient has true divergence axis. Continue with the question. I think it's clear. A, uh, question two. A 65-year-old woman presents for a second opinion regarding an exotropia of 50 prism diopters in primary position 
at distance and near and in all of the diagnostic positions of case. Um, due reduction testing reveals plus two overaction of the inferior oblique muscles in both the in both eyes and plus two overaction of the superior oblique muscles as well. The first surgeon's report uh, the first surgeon's report indicates plan uh, recess and resect bilateral superior oblique to not bilateral inferior oblique mysect. What uh, fundus torsion findings might you expect? Inferior, and what inferior might... oblique myectomy. My, 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 yes, yes. The, okay. author, the author means myectomy. It's a weakening procedure for inferior oblique. Yes, continue, Dr. I. What fundus torsion findings might you expect and what procedure should be performed to correct the overaction and over depression in adduction? Considering the lack of an A or V pattern, the large angle strabismus and the apparent overaction of both the superior oblique over depression in adduction and inferior oblique over elevation in adduction muscles, this patient probably has pseudo overaction of the oblique muscles. The finding is secondary to orbital mechanical factors that allow the deviating eye to move more freely up and down within the orbit compared to the constrained abducting eye. Torsion is likely to be normal in such a case. Oblique muscle surgery should not be performed. I think we mentioned it before. Yes, continue. Question three. A 30-year-old man with a lifelong history of esotropia presents for a st for strabismus surgery. You perform bilateral medial rectus recessions operating for the 50 prism diopter deviation. And two months later, the patient um, returns with straight eyes on Krimsky testing and a residual esotropia of five prism diopters. He states he has been unable to drive since the surgery because of persistent double vision. What is a possible diagnosis and what test could be used to confirm your suspicion? The patient may have diplopia secondary to abnormal retinal correspondence, placing base in prism over the eye to recreate the esotropia would probably alleviate the diplopia, even though his eyes are straight after after image testing would still show the characteristic abnormal retinal correspondence response demonstrated in figure 2.4, regardless of the angle of strabismus at the time it was tested. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Aina. Anyone, Dr. Muhammad, do you want to add any comments? No, no, thanks. Okay. I have a question, please. Yes, Dr. Sara. In a brief, the choice of surgery, according to the type, Many prefer uh, unilateral recess and resect over bilateral lateral recess recession. What's your uh, yani, opinion? Yes, I told you I, I learned this point from a big surgeon, strabismus surgeon, and always he told me don't go for bilateral lateral recess recession. Although the books say the opposite one. Because More, it's uh, uh, unpredictable. Yes. This is from his experience. The mm. books you will see different. Dr. Sara, I'm from a different school. Yes. Uh, most of the surgeons and most of professors here in Egypt uh, did bilateral surgery rather for? than resist resect. For because basic? It's, yes. Because you know, here uh, a recession for, for, for muscles or a section of muscle will affect also the palpebral fissure. And uh, be, if, you, if you have asymmetrical, symmetrical committant surgery in committant uh, strabismus it should it should have a symmetrical palpebral fissure and also a symmetrical extraocular motility because somewhat in 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 large in large numbers in recess resect uh, sometimes you have a the is more lateral incompetence lateral incompetence, uh, uh, some restriction in, 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 in action of, uh, of movement uh, in the muscle, uh, like uh, lateral rectus recession more than uh, 10 millimeter. You will have abduction deficit. You will have abduction deficit. If you have a bilateral surgery, 
it's it will be a production deficit in both sides it will not it will uh, it will not bother the patient Listen, Dr. This is, this is my yesterday opinion. I was discussion with one of my friends. He did pediatric ophthalmology in Australia. He told me the maximum number he did for recession for medial rectus in Australia in one 6. of the no no five point five, not more than that. And for lateral rectus, the maximum they do they they do it's eight millimeter, not more no, than that. It's, it's uh, a twelve. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, you, you know, why. you know, you know, we have a lot of numbers of intermittent exotropia here in Egypt. The 90% of patients here, the 90% of patients here, uh, it's a category of intermittent exotropia. So I, I think uh, we have uh, a more knowledge in intermittent exotropia and, uh, at, uh, and uh, how to deal with lateral rectus recession here. Yes, so so you know when we do big numbers, there is you know limitation in movement of the muscle. There is there is change in the palpebral fissures. Uh, sometimes we have in ophthalmos after surgery, I go like inside, and sometimes there is limitation in abduction or adduction. So high numbers, more restriction in movement, more in ophthalmos, more change because in of the, the resection one, resection yes, or resection more, any yani large number. Yes, large, large number. Yeah. So this okay. is this is why some doctors they didn't like to go for me directly, not more than five point five. And I saw some another thing, another thing, another thing. That. Yes. Another thing, another thing. Uh, the recession, the recession, it's a reversible surgery. Because yes. if you have overcorrection, uh, you can do an advancement for, for, for the muscle. But yes. if you did a, a resection for muscle, it's not a, a reversible. reversible. It's not a reversible. Okay. Okay, let, let us just summarize, especially the types. Can you summarize the types, Dr. Muhammad or Dr. Sara or anyone? So to make it clear for everyone how to differentiate between this. As you say, the, the difference the difference between the neuron and the far. Yes. Uh, the basic, uh, we said that the difference between neuron and far uh, below uh, in present diopter. While yes. if there is uh, of the near more than the far by far uh, by more than ten percent data, so the problem in the near, so it is convergence insufficiency, yes. exo. While the, the the far more than the near um, by more than ten percent data, either pseudo divergence excess or true divergence excess. How to differentiate? Uh, yes. By patch test for thirty minutes uh, or fogging. Uh, the, I I mean, mostly we do patch tests. For 30 minutes, there is difference, and uh, the limit, there is limited um, difference, change in difference between near and far. So it is uh, pseudo divergence. While if there is, if this, this, yeah, the same, the far more than the near, so it is a true divergence. Okay, that's perfect. I think this is the most important, especially for residents, how to differentiate between the type. And when we do the plus three lens, uh, lens test, uh, Dr. Sara. Uh, fogging, uh, uh, same as uh, difference, you yani differentiate between the pseudo divergence and true divergence, especially in patients with high ACE ratio. Okay, yes, uh, Dr. Muhammad, do you want to add any point? No, 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 thanks. Okay, is there any questions from anyone about this case? Uh, we will uh, finish the meeting. Uh, actually, after we discuss, we find one case per day. It will be more informative. We will focus more, and you will be still refreshment for the next session, inshallah. Uh, anyone have any question? Okay. Actually, I will thank you all, uh, Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Sara, Dr. Aima, uh, Dr. Rabia, and everyone for sharing us. Thank you, and inshallah, we will continue next week in the case number three. I will stop I will stop recording now.